cover the budget deficit. But all the others, private sector savings is enough to cover the budget deficit. Well, they're not having, <clears throat> they're having this problem because interest rates in all of these economies actually skyrocketed after the crisis. <clears throat> So instead of coming down, as in in United States, UK, and and uh, e even in in Sweden, interest rates actually <clears throat> went up. Why did interest rates went up in Spain when the private sector savings is actually b bigger than the budget deficit? Very simple reason: if you're a fund manager in United States, UK, or Japan, and if you're under certain rules from the your authorities that you cannot take too much foreign exchange risk. You cannot take too much current, uh, principal risk, meaning you cannot put all your money in stocks, that you have to have some fixed income, and your private sector as a group is not borrowing money, where can you put your money? The only place you can put your money is in the government bond. So that's why bond yields come down to these ridiculously low levels during what I call balance sheet recessions. This is not a bubble. This is what you expect during the balance sheet recession. And this is a natural corrective mechanism of the <clears throat> economy in balance sheet recession by encouraging bond yields to come, government bond yields to come down, encourage government to have larger fiscal stimulus, keep the income from collapsing, allow private sector to have income to pay down debt, and in due course, private sector balance sheets are repaired. Then you fix the government balance sheets. It has to be in that order. But in Europe, that did not work. Spain, Ireland, those bond yields went sky high. Because of the very simple reason, if you're a Spanish fund manager in exactly the same situation, you don't have to buy Spanish government bonds. You can buy German government bond, the Dutch government bond, the Finnish government bond, because they're all in the same currency zone. So fund manager in Spain has 17 choices, whereas fund manager in US, UK, and Japan each have only one. And so what worked outside Europe doesn't work inside Europe. And so that's why I've been suggesting, as, as I mentioned a little earlier, that maybe another measure should be introduced to make sure that some money in Spain will go to Spanish government bond market instead of to the German government bond market. And so I've been suggesting different risk weights that if you're a fund manager in Spain, if you buy your own Spanish government bond, your risk weight is still zero. But if you buy someone else's government bond, even within the same eurozone, your risk weight will be higher. In that case, you will direct at least some portion of the domestic savings to the domestic government bond market. And if that happens and these bond yields come down, then there will be no more crisis. And so I've been pushing that line. Uh, you may say that, well, how do you make sure that this happens? Well, this measure doesn't cost German taxpayer a single penny. Oh, whatever you call it, Penny. <laughs> uh, so there's no reason why German taxpayers should oppose this scheme. If anything will cost the German taxpayers, German taxpayers will be very upset because they think they did everything right and then these guys in the Southern Europe screw themselves up. Why do we have to pay for their mistakes? But that's not exactly how it's happening. It's happening because of this crazy capital flight problems. And this capital flight problem actually have a little bit of history too. And this history goes back to year 2000 when Germany had a massive bubble, the so-called telecom bubble. And you know, German people, like the Japanese people, are very serious types. And if they have nothing else to worry about, they worry about the skies falling on them. <laughs> but something happened to the Japanese 24 years ago, and something happened to the Germans 14 years ago. They went crazy over the tech, uh, tech bubble. And this Neumarkt went from 1,000 to 9,600 and came crashing down, lost 97% of its value, and the market was disbanded and had a new name called Tech Tax. This devastated German balance sheets. The result, this is a German flow of funds. The German company, well, German households were saving, very conservative people, but German companies were appropriately borrowing. But once the tech bubble burst, you see that German companies went straight into the positive range, meaning that they were all saving money instead of paying down debt. Households also increased their savings massively 
by 2005, 2006, these guys are saving 10% of GDP at the lowest interest rates they have ever seen. Against that, but because Germany were in the Eurozone, they were in a balance sheet recession, they should use, they're supposed to have used fiscal stimulus, but they couldn't use the fiscal stimulus because of the 3% rule. The 3% rule was put in by German government as well, so they had to stick with the 3% rule. Private sector is saving 7% of GDP, the economy is collapsing. And so European Central Bank then had to come in to help the German economy by bringing interest rates from 4.75 all the way to 2%, the lowest in the post-war period, tried to save the German economy. But there's no reason for German economy to respond because no one in Germany was borrowing money, as you saw earlier. Companies are paying down debt, uh, households are paying down debt. And to see this more drastically, this is the German household sector. The way that this chart is put together, the blue line is how much they are saving. And orange line is how much they are borrowing. And you notice that until the, the uh, bubble, German households were saving money, but they were also borrowing money to buy houses, cars, whatever. But once the bubble burst, this borrowing disappears completely. So German households just refuse to borrow, try to repair their balance sheets. So savings goes up dramatically here. And this is the reason why German house prices collapsed 10% at the 2% interest rates, the lowest interest rates in the post-war period, because no one was borrowing money to buy houses. But then you look at the other countries. This is Spain. Spanish households, also very conservative people, but when they saw 2% interest rates, the interest rates that even their grandparents haven't seen, they couldn't resist. So they went in a typical textbook reaction. If you, see, if you have a clean balance sheets, interest rates come down to these ridiculously low levels, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to buy real estate with borrowed money. So they borrowed money, tons of money, and that's the housing bubble you saw in Spain. This is Ireland too. Very conservative to begin with, but when they saw 2% interest rates to save the German economy, they couldn't resist either. So they borrowed borrow tons of money, and that's, that's how the Irish bubble uh, happened. Now, in addition to this, and so what, what, it, what this means is that ECB's low interest rate policy worked beautifully for the other countries, not Germany. But beautifully means there are so many borrowers responded to low interest rates. Now, if there are borrowers borrowing money, what happens to money supply? Money supply increases. So this is the money supply increase outside Germany. This is money supply increase in Germany. Because no one's borrowing money, so money supply grows very, very slowly. Here, uh, everybody's borrowing money, so money supply grew very rapidly. At the end of eight years, uh, European non-German money supply is up to 217. We take uh, 1990 as 100. German money supply is only 156. Now, what will that do to the wages and prices? Naturally, wages and prices are much higher here than in here. So the so-called competitiveness gap that a lot of people talk about has a lot to do with this factor, that German money supply was growing very slowly, and the economy, of course, was doing very poorly. So wages and prices went, grew very slowly. Whereas in other parts, wages and prices were going up very ra rapidly because money supply was growing very rapidly and monetary easing was, weak, was working. So <clears throat> this whole idea that, well, we in Germany did all these hard structural reform, pension reform, labor reform, Schroeder 2010 program, and look at those Southern Europeans, they are lazy, having great time next to the, having great wine and you know, great food and chasing lovely girls, or whatever the case may be. You know, that's not the whole story by any stretch of imagination. This part has a very large part to it. It's a macroeconomic lack of synchronization. Germany was in balance sheet recession, everybody else was outside, but central bank had to save the German economy, everybody else went on the bubble. And under the circumstances, you get this kind of competitiveness gap uh, automatically, as it were. And the German economy, how did it come out of this mess? By exporting your way out. With, if you are competitive and everybody else is not competitive, 
uh, this is how you come out, right? So this is the German trade surplus against the rest of Europe. Uh, trade surplus in increased dramatically against the US, a little bit of improvement, against Asia, zero improvement. And so I would argue that we should allow economies within the Eurozone, in balance sheet recession, to run larger budget deficit with a full blessing from EU. Now, if the EU ECB gives a full blessing and the different risk weights that I mentioned to you are also in place, then that will encourage the money from those economies to go to their own government bond. And that keeps the economy from collapsing. That will allow ECB to run monetary policy with, without this distortion coming from one or two countries that are in balance sheet recessions. Interest rate won't have to be lowered to such ridiculously low levels. And <clears throat> to put it more uh, on, on top of all this, German banks during the period when Germany was in balance sheet recession, there was private sector savings, 10% of GDP coming to the German banks. Of that 10%, German private sector is only, uh, German public sector is borrowing only 3%, or slightly more than 3%. So the remaining 7%, German banks had to lend to someone else. So they had to lend to the peripheral countries, they had to buy CD, the toxic CDOs from the American banks, and that's how they got into problems later on. But if the German government were borrowing that money, German banks were simply lent to the German government and didn't have to lend to the peripheral countries or buy CDLs in the United States, so everybody would have been better off. And so I think the key distortion in Europe comes from this 3% rule, which, was, which makes Europe unable to handle balance sheet recessions. And in my 2003 book titled Balance Sheet Recession from uh, John Wiley, I mentioned that if US, Japan, and Europe fell into balance sheet recession, Europe will have the most problems because of this 3% rule. And I think that's the way it's now unfolding in Europe today. And so if we just change one part of the Maastricht Treaty by saying, OK, if the e EC or EU panel of experts determined that the certain country is in balance sheet recession, then that country should be allowed to run larger budget deficit with the full blessing from the EU ECB. And that will allow, and by, bal by balance sheet recession, they have their own savings inside the country that can finance it. And that will make everybody, uh, the whole system work much better. In fact, I, I believe that there's only two things that needs to be corrected in Europe. One is the dif different risk weights, and the other is this provision, in a, in a new provision in the Maastricht Treaty. If those two are in place, I think Euro can function uh, beautifully without uh, this Euro bonds or fiscal, fiscal unification or uh, whatever. All we need is those two corrections to make Euro work. And they don't cost German taxpayers anything. That's the most important part <laughs> that we have to emphasize. I think this might be the last question. Uh, I know you love to talk about Europe, but sorry, I, I have a question about Japan. I'm Martin Fritz, working for the German magazine Wirtschaftswoche. Um, two questions. One is, you didn't mention the word deflation. So could you say something about QE and deflation? Is it possible to kill deflation with QE in Japan. And the second thing is, I think one unique other part about the QE in Japan is it's done while we are not in a recession. It's done while the economy is actually growing. So it's not against the recession, it's against deflation. So could you elaborate on that? Well, you're very sharp-eared for noticing that I did not talk much about deflation. I hate that word <laughs> because it's only a symptom of the problem. It's not the reason we have these problems in Japan today. First of all, average Japanese, 80 to 90% of the Japanese, if you ask them, are we in deflation or not? They will say, no, we are not in deflation, we are in inflation. And that can be certified by this uh, cabinet 
Japanese cabinet survey of, of average Japanese people, as well as the Bank of Japan survey, which indicate that 80 to 90 percent of the people simply said, we, we are not in deflation. Uh, all these years, not just recently, but all these years, because those expenses that relates to their living, like energy, the rent, all of those, never really felt all that much, and some actually went up. It's like color television and computers that, that came down uh, dramatically in value, but you, know, you cannot eat computers, right? So living expenses didn't really fall, and the fact that they didn't fall, or the average people don't think that they are, they are in deflation, means they were not delaying purchases. If you, if, you're in defl if you believe you're in deflation, then you delay your purchases because you think things are cheaper later in the future. And that is supposed to be bad for the economy. But if 80 to 90% of the population never felt that they're in deflation, then that part was never an issue either. So what is the issue? The key issue is that private sector as a group is not borrowing money. That's the issue. And they're not borrowing money even at zero interest rates. And that makes money multiplier negative at the margin. And all the monetary policy uh, tools fail to produce results. And I think it failed. That, so that I don't think QE has done any good in the United States or UK either. Because if you look at those uh, monetary aggregates that I indicated to you earlier, none of those countries, you actually see green line moving higher meaning that all the QE that was put in basically got stuck in the banking system and didn't come out. And so if they didn't come out, how can you have inflation? And actually, US inflation is coming down, European inflation rate is coming down because the money is not really entering the, the private sector, and that's because of the balance sheet problems. So I would argue that in this kind of situation, and only in this kind of situation, you have to use fiscal policy, government borrowing and spending money to keep the income of the private sector from collapsing. And that by keeping the income from collapsing, private sector has the income to pay down debt. And once they repair their balance sheets, then you reverse the order. You allow the government to repair its balance sheets and let the private sector borrow money. But we are not in that stage yet. We are still on this stage. So I don't think ECB should be the one to carry the burden, it should be the government and the fiscal policy to, to carry the day. Now, I have to make one <coughs> uh, condition to it, and that is that when we have a financial crisis, you know, when the bubble bursts, two problems happen, the borrower's problem and the lender's problem. The borrower's problem I call balance sheet recession. The lender's problem is called financial crisis because the banks uh, go bankrupt, and in that Lenders problem, central bank has to act and has to act decisively. So I have nothing against QE1 or what is known as QE1 around the world because at that time, if the central bank did not play the lender of last resort, the whole thing would have collapsed. So that part I have nothing against. But QE2 and beyond, where they thought they could do something to the macroeconomy by pumping this money into the system, I think we are going to pay a very high price for it going forward. Thank you. I think this wraps up our event. Anthony, you have something? Very, very quickly, please. Thank you. You mentioned that um, the Bank of Japan was a pioneer in quantitative easing. They pulled out of it in 2006. The Japanese economy didn't collapse, as far as I remember. So can other countries learn from the Japanese experience and how to end QE? Well, I thought I already answered that. Did you? I'm sorry, I just missed you. Can you? No, BOJ, yeah. knowing that if you played at the long end of the government bond market, it would be very difficult to rescind QE. That's why they did everything at the short end, asking banks to issue uh, note so that they can uh, end it very quickly. Thank you very much, Mr. Ku, for your insights. And uh, this wraps up our event. I would like to give you uh, one year uh, honorary membership in our club. 
I hope you come back next year and tell us how uh, the effect of the tax is uh, appeared in the Japanese economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming and have a nice evening.